Hello everyone and welcome to this week's SEDS Online webinar. Uh, we're really pleased to welcome our speaker, Kathy Benison, and we're really pleased to be able to offer these, resu these um, resources on SEDS Online and these webinars for free, thanks to gen general sponsorship from the International uh, Sedimentology Associ um, Association of Sedimentologists, the IAS. So, um, Kathy Benison, um, she completed her undergraduate degree at Bridgewater State College in Massachusetts, where she double majored in geology and chemistry. She then went on to complete a master's in geology at Binghamton University in 1993 before completing a PhD in geology at the University of Kansas in 1997. She then became professor of geology at Central Michigan University, where she worked for 15 years. In 2012, Kathy moved to West Virginia University, where she set up her research group, the Red Earth Observatory Lab. She is presently a professor of geology and a science team member for Mars 2020. Kathy uses techniques in sedimentary geology, geochemistry, and geomicrobiology to study the deposition and diagenesis of continental evaporites in red beds in both modern environments and on Mars. And today she's going to be telling us about astrobiological tombs. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, everybody. I'm Kathy Benison. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. Um, I wanted to start with this photo. This is one of my favorite science photos. This is Carl Sagan standing next to a Viking one or two uh, lander prototype in Death Valley. And when I was a kid, the only scientists I knew were on TV. There was Jacques Cousteau and Carl Sagan. So this is um, one of my memories as a kid. This picture was taken in 1975 and it uh, really inspired me about the excitement of science. But now when I look at this photo, I think of three things. I see that it's in Death Valley and Death Valley is famous for its salt deposits and it has a Mars spacecraft in it. So that reminds me of Mars. And it has Carl Sagan, who is a pioneer of the field of astrobiology. This talk will focus on those three things, salt, Mars, and astrobiology. The title of my talk is Salt on Mars, Astrobiological Tombs. For this talk, um, we'll start with an overview of the sedimentology of Mars and talk a bit about what we know about salt minerals on Mars. And then we'll talk about some good terrestrial analogs for some of those salt minerals on Mars that, are, that come from acid saline lakes on Earth. And I'll tell you a bit about what we know about the microbiology of those acid saline lakes on Earth and how it's trapped in salt minerals. And Finally, we'll talk about how that information can inform us for the search of, for life on Mars. Before I really delve into the talk, I would like to acknowledge funding and collaborators. And I especially want to mention that a lot of this research that um, is in this talk is funded by a NASA exobiology grant. The, there's been a lot of people involved in different aspects of this research, but in particular, microbiology, microbiology collaborators, Melanie Mormile, Franca Obo, Ikenobi, Sarah Johnson, and Elena Zakova are acknowledged. And um, I also want to mention Brenda Bowen, who has been um, a collaborator for many years in the Western Australia field work with me. All right, well, the space program has had a long history in sending spacecraft to Mars, and it started in the mid-60s with the Mariner orbiters. And there's been a lot of orbiters, and there's a lot of orbiters right now circling Mars, and they send back a lot of data. Most of what we know from Mars, I would say, comes from orbiters um, that send mineral data, they send atmospheric data, and they send um, images and topography data. So I wanted to remember to mention orbiters for that reason. There have also been landers on Mars. So I mentioned that Viking 1 and 2 landed in um, the 70s in 1976 and sent back um, chemical data of the atmosphere and other conditions of the atmosphere for its landing site. 
as well as chemical data from the sediments at its landing site. And more recently, there are rovers on Mars. So here are some of the rovers. When I was finishing my PhD um, the, in 1997, the Pathfinder Sojourner rover, this little one in the middle, was sending back images from Mars. And it's, it's the first time that I really um, got scientifically interested in Mars and thought that the images it was sending back looked a lot like the Permian red beds and evaporites that I was studying for my PhD. Um, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the part of the Mars Exploration Rover Program, um, they just got so much more data than was anticipated. They were active for a long time on Mars, and there's still a lot of data um, to be studied from, from that mission. And Curiosity landed in 2012. Curiosity um, is still active on Mars, sending back lots of great data, great images. It's very exciting. And the next generation of Mars rover is the Perseverance rover, which is part of the 2020 mission, and it's on its way to Mars right now. And the Perseverance rover looks a lot like the Curiosity rover. It has better tires. That's one important thing. Um, it has some upgrades on instrumentation, but probably the most exciting thing is the Perseverance rover for the first time has a way to drill and store core samples, small core samples. So later in the talk, we'll talk more about the Perseverance rover and the plan for storing, for taking samples and, and storing them so that they could be returned to Earth later. Here are rover and lander locations, and the white ones, InSight and Curiosity, are the two active ones now. And then in blue, you see the star is on Jezero Crater, which is the landing site for the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. A lot of the geology of Mars looks really similar to the geology of Earth. There are volcanoes and volcanic rocks. There are glaciers and ice caps. There is a lot of wind activity and a lot of dunes on Mars. And there are, of course, channels on Mars. So sedimentologists have a big role to play in helping to understand Mars. Okay, well, what about salt minerals on Mars? There are um, gypsum dunes on Mars. There's quite a lot of um, unlithified gypsum grains on Mars that get blown around. There's also halite on Mars. Halite is very difficult to interpret spectroscopically, and most of this data is spectral data that's coming from orbiters. Um, but there is, there has been interpretations of halite on Mars, and a lot of it looks like it's in these polygonal crusts, which look like dried up salt lakes to me. And there are rocks as well. There are outcrops that are composed of saline minerals such as gypsum. This is one of my favorite pictures from Mars. This was taken by the Opportunity rover in Victoria Crater. And um, it shows what looks like three different units. There's a cross bedded sandstone that you see in the middle of the photo with beautiful tangential cross bedding. There is a finer grained mudstone that looks like it has mud cracks above that. And then there's a cro what looks like a cross bedded sandstone at the top. Um, and these are all have been interpreted as being composed of hydrated calcium sulfates, gypsum. When the rovers look closely at rocks on Mars, they see depositional and diagenetic gypsum. There are sandstones in which the class seem to be composed of gypsum. There are also um, molds of crystals with crystal shapes, as you see on the right-hand side of the screen here. These shapes are characteristic of gypsum. They, they could be other minerals too, but they look like evaporite minerals that have dissolved. And displacive evaporite minerals, like displacive gypsum and displacive ha halite, commonly form in unlithified sediments when salty groundwater that's close to the surface precipitates them. So, so I think that this picture with the evaporite molds is showing us evidence of 
um, shallow, early, salty groundwaters. If we look at the lower left, we see a veins. There are a lot of veins of gypsum on Mars as well with, um, with gypsum cements. So what do salt minerals on Mars tell us? Well, they tell us that there's a history of salty water, both salty surface water and salty groundwaters on Mars. To better understand salt minerals on Mars, we need to do comparative sedimentology. We need to do this on a planetary scale though. So um, the best known analogs for the salt systems, the rocks containing salt on Mars, seem to be acid saline lakes on Earth. So here are two examples of modern acid saline lakes from the Yilgarn Craton of Western Australia, where there are probably thousands of these small, shallow, ephemeral saline lakes, and the high Andes of Chile on the Chile-Argentina border, where there are just a couple of these lakes. So they're very different geologic settings, but they have very similar minerals. The minerals are consistent with what is found on Mars. There's halite, gypsum, iron oxides, clay minerals, um, and acid minerals, jarosite, and alunite. So all of that is in common with what is on Mars. And the sedimentary structures and diagenetic features are also very similar to what we see on Mars. So we think that these acid saline lakes on Earth are good analogs for Mars. Salt minerals precipitate from salty surface waters and salty groundwaters. And evaporite sedimentologists have different names for different places and different types of salt minerals. Um, two types of crystals can form at, in surface water, salty surface waters. And they include minerals that grow from the sediment water interface at the bottom of a salty water body. Um, and we call those bottom growth crystals because they're growing from the bottom upward into the water. There are also um, crystals that grow at the air water interface or within the water column and we call those cumulate crystals. And both cumulate and bottom growth crystals form beds and they are truly sediments or sedimentary rocks. We call them chemical sediments. Um, so they are evidence of past surface waters. But there are also a lot of different diagenetic forms that saline minerals can take, and they can form early or later from different groundwaters. The other thing you see in this image is there are these yellow star shapes, and these are supposed to symbolize microbes. And we find that there are microorganisms that live in saline surface waters, in groundwaters, as well as in dry sediments. There are hundreds of different types of salt minerals, but the most common by far are halite and gypsum. So for this talk, we're really gonna focus on halite and gypsum, but a lot of the things that I say about these hold true for other saline minerals as well. So here's some images of chemical sediments. And so the top, row shows halite and the bottom shows gypsum. If we look at the two leftmost pictures, these are showing bottom growth crystals of halite on the top and gypsum on the bottom in situ. And they're in a lake in Western Australia and we're looking through about 10 centimeters of water and the crystals form a crust at the bottom of those lakes. If we look at the middle of the photo, we see cross sections of those crusts. So for the halide crystals, we see cubic crystals that get bigger as they go up. And um, the bottom picture shows us gypsum in cross section in a, a crude core that I took. Um, and those crystals also get bigger upward. If we look with um, a microscope, if we take a razor blade and we shave off little pieces of the halide or gypsum and we look under the microscope, we see that they are full of fluid inclusions. Fluid inclusions are remnant water that has gotten trapped um, in the crystals themselves. So there is actually preserved water from the lake that grew these crystals. 
salt minerals grow very rapidly, um, geologically speaking. Actually, you can sit and watch salt crystals growing over you know, a matter of an hour, you can see a crystal grow. As salt grows, it traps water, solids, air, organisms. It really can trap anything in its path. So some of the fluid inclusions that we see are all liquid, like the photo on the left shows all liquid fluid inclusions. These cubic shapes are in a bottom growth halite crystal. Some fluid inclusions trap air and water, as in this picture in the bottom middle. That's a big air bubble that got trapped. So we can analyze past atmosphere this way. Some fluid inclusions trap crystals as well. These little yellow crystals are trapped within a fluid inclusion. Um, and some trap microorganisms. So the picture on the bottom right shows some dimpled spheres and then a little round smaller sphere. Um, the two bigger yellow dimpled spheres are algae and the little, the little one is a prokarya, either archaea or bacteria, trapped within a fluid inclusion. Um, I put up the picture of the mosquito to remind me to tell you that solids can get trapped too. You don't need to have liquids and we just call these solid inclusions. And so it's common to find insect parts trapped in halite and gypsum. There are diverse microbial communities that live in these extreme environments and these critters need to be able to withstand and maybe even thrive in low pHs, high salinities, complex unusual chemistries. I didn't tell you much about the chemistry, but um, there are in these acid saline waters, there are sometimes tens of thousands of ppm aluminum that's dissolved in the water and silica and iron. So these are highly complex uh, waters. These waters also undergo flooding, evapoconcentration, desiccation. These environments have high winds. And so these conditions of changing flooding, evapoconcentration, and desiccation change the amount of water at the surface, it changes the salinity, and it changes the pH of the waters. And so these microorganisms need to be able to live with that. There are fluctuating air and water temperatures. Most of these environments are in deserts where there's a high diurnal temperature change from day to night. And these environments tend to have high solar radiation as well. So you could say that the, um, any kind of microorganisms living in these acid saline lakes on earth are superbugs. They are extremophiles. I'd like to give you an example, a case study of life at a place called Lake Magic in Western Australia. So Lake Magic is aptly named. It, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. It dries up and it floods. It changes color as well. So every time I've been there, it's been a little bit different. And I've been there, I think, eight times now. Um, so the red canoe shows up here. Um, I don't know how the red canoe got there, but it seems like a good, it's a good um, scale here. So these four different times are all in January. And there are times when the lake is undergoing evapoconcentration in 2006, as well as in 2015. And the pHs are low, 1.8, 2.0, and the salinity is high. There are times when the lake floods and all the halite and gypsum dissolves and um, the pH goes up, but it's still pretty, pretty acidic at 3.5 and the salinity goes down. And then there's times that the lake totally dries up. So these are very ephemeral systems. They're very, they fluctuate a lot with time. When we go in the field, one of the things that we always do is to look for what we call microbial suspects or any signs of life. So um, the picture taken on the left was taken during a flooding event in 2011. There had been a rainstorm that caused sheet floods to carry the dark material, which is um, eucalyptus debris, mostly leaves, to the lake shore and into the lake. But then there was also this funny yellow foam. And when we looked up closely at this yellow foam, it looked really slimy and incorporates a lot of the, the salts. 
when we look at that water that we collected right there, it's um, under the microscope, it's full of these little um, chains, which we think are probably fungi. And then when we cultured this, sure enough, we see these fungal shapes. And this is an unknown, previously undescribed yellow fungi here. We've done a summary of the Lake Magic taxonomy. And so here is um, just two samples. I'm showing you a lake water and a groundwater sample from Lake Magic. And the size of the circles represents diversity as well as abundance, but mainly diversity of the um, microorganisms and other life forms here. So the lake water, I want to start with the lake water column with the green circles. You can see the biggest circle is for eukaryotes. This is mostly fungi and algae. And this was a huge surprise to us because most of the time when we think about life in extreme environments, we assume that it's mostly archaea. And look, there's very little archaea here. And then we assume that there's bacteria. There's some bacteria, but there's a lot more eukaryotes. So that was very interesting to us. The other thing that we noticed is the groundwater only taken only a meter away from the lake water sample. Very shallow groundwater close to the surface near the lake shore has a different group of microorganisms and it has a lot of bacteria. Um, so this was, this was very interesting to us. We also were able to analyze the prokaryotes to look at bacterial and archaeal communities and their diversity. And so there's a lot of data here, but I really would just like you to focus on the colors. We've got a lake water sample and a groundwater sample. The different colors represent different microorganisms. And so one of the things that we see here is in both cases, lake water and groundwater, there is a diversity of communities. There's not just one or two types of organisms. There's a lot. So there's a high diversity. The other thing we notice is that there's a different population in the lake water compared to the groundwater, if you look at the color differences. The last thing to note is that many of these, all the gray things are novel microorganisms. These are bacteria or archaea that have never been described before. When we look at the halite and the gypsum that forms at Lake Magic, and we look at it under the microscope, we can see that there are microorganisms that are trapped in those fluid inclusions. And um, the, we see little round bright spots that are one and two microns in size. Those are prokaryotes. We see big yellow dimpled um, spheres that are Dunaliella algae, and then sometimes we even see flagellum. So we can see these with transmitted light under a regular microscope. We can also use UV light and pair it with the transmitted light. Um, and we look for fluorescent response that is characteristic of different types of organic compounds and organisms. So the picture on your left and the picture of your right are the same view. One is in transmitted light, one is in UV light. Um, we can see that there are three big round balls that are about, oh, they're about six or seven microns um, in diameter. They're dimpled, they're yellow, and they fluoresce blue. That's characteristic of algae. We also see there's a little green sphere. It fluoresces green. That's characteristic of bacteria or archaea. And there's this blob of yellow that fluoresces pink and blue and, and pink and purple. And that's characteristic of carotenoids such as beta carotene. So the UV light allows us to, to um, understand a little bit about the chemistry of these um, microbial suspects. And then we can go to a laser Raman microprobe and look at the spectroscopy of individual um, microorganisms and organic compounds. So in this case, we have this yellow blob and we analyzed it, we zapped it with the laser and analyzed it and found that the Raman spectra looks like this. And this is matches known Raman spectra for beta carotene. So this is beta carotene here. Okay, so I've just shown you microbes trapped in fluid inclusions in modern halite, 
but how long can these microorganisms and organic compounds remain preserved in salt minerals? This is some Permian salts, and we see um, in this picture on your right, you see this big brown blob with a kind of a, a dark rim. We think this is algae. There's a prokaryote in here, and there's carotenoid in here. So we find these in Permian um, halite that also formed in acid salt lakes. We can look at solid inclusions that do not look mineral. They look like they are organic and they also fluoresce green. From the, this is also from the Permian Nipawala group of Kansas, an acid saline lake deposit. And finally, we can go back even farther. Um, Sarah Schreider Gomes is doing a master's thesis right now where she has just started looking and, um, at the Proterozoic ground formation from the Officer Basin in Western Australia. And she's finding that there are uh, well-preserved fluid inclusions in this 830 million year old halite and they have um, microbial suspects in them. All right, so now let's think about Mars, where to look for life on Mars. The old saying was follow the water. And I think the new saying should be follow the salt minerals and follow their fluid inclusions. So on Mars, we see a lot of loose gypsum. Gypsum sand um, is most commonly made by gypsum bottom growth crystals that, got re that formed in lakes and were reworked by the wind. And so they still carry with them the fluid inclusions from the original lake deposits. So I think those should be investigated on Mars. Um, there are gypsum outcrops such as this one um, at Burns, the Burns formation, that is a gypsum sandstone. And also, I got a picture of blueberries here. These are iron oxide concretions. In terrestrial acid saline systems, there are iron oxide concretions, hematite concretions that form just under the lakes and they form very early. And when you slice them in half, you find that they have halite and gypsum on the inside. And those halite and gypsum crystals have fluid inclusions that have microorganisms. So this is another potential astrobiological tomb. And maybe these iron oxide concretions are the best astrobiological tomb because iron oxide has been shown to block UV radiation. And that's always a concern when we think about the search for life on Mars. So the Mars 2020 mission is going to have the Perseverance rover and it has Four goals this mission, looking for habitability, seeking biosignatures, caching samples, and preparing for humans. The preparing for humans is an experiment that will be done by an instrument called MOXIE to see if the CO2 rich atmosphere on Mars can be converted to oxygen. Um, but the other three are really tied in with um, looking for life in rock samples on Mars and sediment samples on Mars. So by looking for habitability, we're looking for signs that the sedimentary rocks on Mars once um, were formed in habitable environments. Seeking biosignatures, we're looking for things like microorganisms and organic compounds and chemical signatures that would suggest biological activity. And the caching the samples is selecting samples that look really good for habitability and biosignatures, drilling a core of them, and then, and then storing them on Mars until another mission in 10 to 15 years comes and collects them and brings them back to Earth for study on Earth. Perseverance is going to land in Jezero Crater. Um, Jezero Crater, if you look in the picture on the left, has a big inflow channel on the, um, the northwest side, we'll call it northwest for here, and it has a, a smaller outflow channel on the other side. Um, when we look at it, we see there's a beautiful delta feature here, and it's thought that this um, crater became a lake and filled with lake sediments. The colors that you see on this map are tied in with the dominant mineralogy. So there are clays, 
there are magnesium carbonates and there are um, olivines. A lot of carbonates and olivines are intimately related here. And there's also a lot of clay minerals, especially smectites. So the circle shows the landing area and the rover, the plan is for the rover to move up the delta and then up and outside of the crater, um, analyzing and taking samples as it goes. This is what the um, drill bit looks like. And each drill, the drill bit is gonna have a tube for every sample that it drills. And so this tube is, the, is where the cores will be sealed and contained. And you can see it's not very big. These are basically gonna be the size of chalk, each sample. And we're hoping to drill 30 samples. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that any salt minerals and samples returned to Earth should be examined for potential biosignatures and fluid inclusions. We can't do this with the rovers on Mars. We really need to bring back samples to look for microorganisms and fluid inclusions. But I think that the search for life on Mars will not have been exhausted without petrographic and geochemical analysis of its salts. Because as Carl Sagan reminded us, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a great talk, Kathy. That's um, incredible that there's this whole vault of potential that we just haven't tapped yet on Mars. It's amazing. Um, anybody, uh, so we're now asking for, for comments in the, in the chat. So anybody who's got a question, please type into the chat and, and we'll ask Kathy to answer it for us. And if you're watching this as a recording, please um, leave a comment in the forum, in the uh, dedicated thread in the forum and, um, and we'll be able to make sure that that gets answered too. Right now though, if you're watching this in like early August um, 2020, this, the forums are down for a little bit longer. We're just getting things sorted with the plugins, but they'll be back up very soon. So um, that will be fully functional. Um, so great, we have a first question from Stephen Lockyer. He's saying, hi, uh, Stephen watching from Wales. Thanks for the great talk. There are various accounts of people reanimating microbes found in salt. What do you think the chances of doing this from an organism from Mars? That's a great question. And it gets us into the range of sound, sounding like a B movie. Um, one, of, one of my most enjoyable experiences as a scientist was serving on a national research council where that was the question we asked is if samples if we brought back samples to look for life would we reanimate them and then would they cause any trouble on earth was the next question so um, to reanimate them if you will you need to have the, these are critters that um, are very um, tuned in to their environment, very sensitive to living in very salty and maybe very acidic waters. And so they're not going to be things, they're going to be things that we, I think we could reanimate, but only if we really want to. You can see the movie titles already. <laughs> um, next question's from Huan Chi, um, who says, I'm curious, why is the pH so low in Lake Magic? The pH in Western Australia is so low um, because there's been a long history of chemical weathering and then drying. So um, these rocks have some, a lot of dissolved, a lot of disseminated sulfate minerals in them, especially pyrite and copper sulfates sulfides and with chemical weathering there has been um uh buffer all the buffer elements all the buffer minerals like like um carbonates have have gone away so there's no carbonates there's nothing in the system to really buffer acids well and then if you have um oxidation of sulfides it make sulfate and it makes sulfuric acid. And if you have nothing to buff buffer that sulfuric acid, then it's gonna remain low pH. And then you add into it the fact that this is a very dry climate where evapoconcentration concentrates the chemistry and lowers the pH more. 
there may also be a role that the microorganisms play because we know there are some microorganisms that live in low pHs and they actually can make pH a little bit lower. So there's actually a, a kind of a complicated story about how the systems in Western Australia became acidic. And I think that that similar story is true for the Pangean environments, the Permian red beds and evaporites. On the other hand, when we go to the Andes and we see the um, acid systems in Chile, those are sitting right on top of a magmatic system, an active volcanic system. And so in that case, I think those are, they're, they're low temperature waters, but they're hydrothermal systems that have a lot of hydrogen sulfide. So the Chile and the Western Australia acid saline lake systems have very similar minerals, very similar sedimentary structures, very similar diagenetic features, but they're formed in different geologic settings. Great. Um, our next question is from Stephen again, um, asking why is there a disconnect between the lake and groundwater critters in Lake Magic? That is a great question. Um, we know there's a lot of temporal changes in these lakes in Western Australia due to flooding, evapoconcentration, and desiccation. But we also know, we've also found that there is a spatial um, heterogeneity where I think it has to do with the host rocks. So the, the water there, the groundwater, doesn't seem to be moving very fast. It seems to be sitting and simmering in whatever the local host rocks are. These are Archean host rocks that have faults and they have some veins and you can go to one lake and see, um, you know, a, a Precambrian um, banded iron formation. And then on the other side of the lake, you could see a, a meta basalt. Um, you could see quartzite. Lake Magic is, for all of the lakes that we study, is probably the most homogenous in terms of the bedrock, but I think a little bit of a difference in bedrock can be adding to the chemistry there. So we don't have a really great answer for that yet, though. Watch the space. You watch the space, yeah. <laughs> We've had a few thank yous come through uh, as well for um, answers and for the talk. So that's great. Um, our next question is from Alfonso Valero Regazzo, who says, um, hi, nice talk. Where in Jezero Crater could the best point for detection of salt minerals containing microbial activity be? So this is a, um, a challenging question because the, the mineral data that we have is all from orbiters for Jezero Crater. And that is only showing us surface minerals, and it's only really showing us the dominant minerals. And so some minerals, like halite, we know don't show up well that way. Um, we do see sulfates. There are layered sulfates that are on the outer edge, especially, of Jezero Crater. And so um, if this mission, I should knock on wood, is successful and we get the rover outside of the crater, um, after having analyzed things in the crater, I think the best chances for success of finding the salts might be on the edge and just outside of the crater. Um, there are carbonate minerals too, and we don't know much about the carbonate minerals and what form they're in, and they're along the edge of the inside of the crater. And carbonates can, can be chemical sediments as well, and so they might contain fluid inclusions with microorganisms. So I think that's worth um, looking at as well. I think a lot of what we learn about Jezero Crater, we're not going to find until we have the rover on the ground and we can look at the rocks up close. Sure. Um, our next question is from Amina Azi saying, hi, um, Jerome Juliet, um, she's a soil scientist. If we do not find any extremophilic fossil microorganisms in these Martian salty sediments, will this end the debate of life on Mars? I don't think so. I don't think so, because I think there are other kinds of organisms that could potentially have been there in the past. Um, I think it's just one avenue to pursue when we search for life on Mars. 
Our next question is from Brendan Gilmore um, saying, hi, Brendan from Queen's Belfast. Thanks for a great talk. How likely is it that significant bodies of Connaught water might exist in Martian halos? How, can you say that, how likely is it that? Significant bodies of Connaught water might exist in Martian halos. In the halide itself as fluid inclusions? Is that, I think so. Is that what the question is? Okay. Um, There's a high likelihood when we look at halite, some halite has been recrystallized. Halite on Earth, some has been recrystallized and we don't see that much for um, fluid in it. And some has a lot. And even the fact that a lot of it on Earth can be very old and have a lot of fluid inclusions, I think is, um, I think gives us, gives us some optimistic reasons to, to look for fluid inclusions on, in halite or any other chemical sediments on Mars. Okay. Um, our next question is from Marcello Natto, saying thanks for the nice talk, Kathy. Um, I'm from Italy. From your experience, did you find in gypsum fluid inclusions the same microorganisms or the same shape of halite? To, um, regardless of the age. Yeah. This, is a, this is a great question and I was hoping someone would ask about the gypsum. So um, what we find is the gypsum from the same lakes does seem to trap many of the same microorganisms. Um, so we find the same, same general characteristics of, of in the gypsum fluid inclusions. But one of the challenges with using gypsum for this is that ancient gypsum tends to have undergone so much dehydration and hydration where it's transferred back and forth between gypsum and anhydrite that that destroys the fluid inclusions. So when we look at our Permian samples and our Precambrian samples that also have gypsum and anhydrite, we don't see fluid inclusions preserved in those. So for the modern gypsum, this seems to work really well at least on Earth. So, but who knows with Mars, it's a different planet, maybe there hasn't been the same alteration of some of the hydrated sal um, saline minerals on Mars that there is on Earth. Um, our next question is from Alexandra Sousa saying, was the paleo-ocean water on Mars similar in composition to Earth's oceans? What do you think? So, what we, what we know, the evidence we can use basically is the mineralogy. So when we look at minerals on Mars, we find that places where we think there was surface water, we see combinations of gypsum, clay minerals, iron oxides, and jarosite and alunite and sometimes halite. That group of minerals together is, as a group, is very rare on Earth. And the only place we see it to them together as a mineral assemblage on Earth is in acid saline systems. And so that leads me to think that on Mars, those oceans were acid saline systems. Okay. Um, that connects to the next question, actually, from Gary Hampson saying, hi, Kathy. Are you expecting to find any minerals that differ to those that occur naturally on Earth? And this is uh, from Gary Hampson in London. We've, we've talked about this in our um, preparation meetings for Mars 2020. Um, you know, we, we might encounter some minerals that have, that are new to us, um, but there, there's enough um, really good chemical instruments on the rover that we should be able to distinguish um, that these are what their main chemistry is um, and even if we don't recognize them as being something we know on earth they might be something similar okay great i think that's all of our questions then for today um, so thank you so much for the talk um, Kathy, I honestly really appreciate it and it's a, it was a fantastic combination of things with a big mystery at the end. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for your great questions and, and comments. 
and there have been some more thank yous coming through for you from from the uh, viewers as well Kathy so we hope to see you at next week's webinar um take a look on our events page to see what's what's coming up and um please come along to our SEDS online coffee breaks as well we've got a new um sort of layout for them on the website um which is fresh off the press today so go and check that out and we've got a couple of new times as well so um hopefully there is a time now that's convenient for people to come along and chat with your uh, colleagues around the world during these difficult times so yeah go and check out the website and um, hope to see you all next week thanks for coming thank you everybody thank you catherine and stephen